on the campus of North Greensville University, they had a garden of prayer, and it was a beautiful, beautiful place. We would uh, go there as a group. That's where we went to the, the summer camp at, the, the church camp, the Northern Greenville University. And we'd go there, and we'd meet with the students, and we'd just um, pray together and discuss the topics of the night. Um, one night we found ourselves, it was the night after the pastor told the story. They, they had five themes. Um, the first theme was, the, the week was entitled Connect. And so we talked about connecting to the lost. We talked about connecting to those who hurt us. We talked about connecting to authority. Um, and the pastor talked um, on the fourth night about connecting, or this was, the, yes, the fourth night. He was talking about connecting to um, to those who have heard us, and that's where he shared his story of forgiveness at. And after that that uh, that sermon, we went back to, to talk about it with the students. And um, right now, I, I currently sit under, um, uh, you guys might know him, Pastor Roger Ball from Emmanuel Church, um, pastor, discipler, and friend of mine. And he raises the question that night when we're sitting in our group. Now, you got to imagine it's me, him, and one other female adult, and there's 19 teenagers, so we're a bit outnumbered. Um, and he raises the question, who is it that we need to forgive? And as these children were, as we were going around, these children were talking um, about all these people and their families that, that they needed to forgive. And, and one kid, he shared that um, he had lost his mother really early on and um, that there was a lot of things that he really wished he, he could say to her and could have said to her. And he shared about how the last word his mother said to him was simply the word yes when he asked her a question. And she walked out the door and um, she got into a car accident and uh, she was non-responsive um, ever since until, until she passed. And so these kids are going around and, and, and they're talking about you know, their bad family situations. We, we serve over at Emmanuel, we serve a youth that is made up of primarily unchurched children. Families aren't churched. They don't go to church. And yet they come to youth group because they find a safe and peaceable atmosphere where they're not judged or criticized or given a list of rules or, you know, um, they're, they're treated as people. And so I'm hearing about all these family stories and, 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 and home lives that, Man, I, I remember how bad mine was. I had an alcoholic mother, no father. Um, my sister, my brother, and I ran rampant all over the neighborhood, getting all kinds of trouble. And, and you know, uh, I, I couldn't help it as, as Pastor Roger began to turn the tables on us about who we needed to forgive in our, in our households and in our families. I began to think about my father. And... Uh, you know, I, I've always told myself about how much I had forgiven my father. And, um, you know, I, I still make that conscious choice every time those old memories come up to, to forgive him, of, you know, that I have forgiven him of those things. But, la but that night, God was really laying it on my heart. As a matter of fact, we, we formed a circle. And, um, and Pastor Roger said, you know, I want you to, to envision that person you need to forgive in the center of that circle. And when I asked God who that person was, my father came to mind, so I, I placed him there. And after we got done praying and everybody began to share about their experience and who they were placing in the circle, I really felt God wanted me to share, you know, my experience and who I placed in the circle and, and why I placed them in the circle. And, you know, it was it's still a part of my life that, you know, I, I really don't know that I'm ready to share with, with too many people. Um, not in depth anyway, not in the depth that God wanted me to go that night. And, and I was reluctant to do so. And I, uh, the, 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 the urging kept going on and on and on. And finally we, we ended and we were walking away. And one of the students walked up to me and he said, Can I talk to you? And I said, Sure. So I pulled him aside. And uh, he sat down. And before he could even get a full sentence out of his mouth, he began to cry. And he said, I just can't forgive my dad. He said, 
When I go over to my dad's house and I ask him for something simple, whether it's something to eat or take me to go get a new toy or something like that, his response to me is, I pay child support and I shouldn't have to get you anything. He tells me that when he's at his dad's house, now this child has seven brothers and sisters. And he says that when they are at their father's house, if the father is there, he normally leaves after the mother drops them off and leaves them to fend for themselves. He ignores them and treats them like they're not there. And so as this kid is just, he's just pouring out to me about this, this horrible relationship he has with his father, I begin to get all choked up because he's telling my story. He's telling the very same emotions and the very, it might not be the same circumstance, but it's the same emotions that, that I was dealing with inside. It was funny because God wouldn't let me get away from it. I thought I was going to be able to walk away from that, from that meeting and not have to, to share. And then God sends this 12-year-old child my way. And I began to share in depth with him about the feelings of hurt and disappointment that I still deal with to this day, the things that have shaped my life. And we cried together, and we prayed together, and we forgave together. You know, forgiveness is something that, that maybe we just glaze over too often. The pastor talked about, this is Pastor Eric at, at the Centrifuge, um, week uh, um, church camp. He talked about how we in American Christianity today see see forgiveness as I'm just going to not associate with you anymore. I won't be mean to you, but when I see you, I'm probably not going to talk to you. I won't be mean. I won't say any nasty things. I won't bring it up, but I'm just going to completely sever the relationship and how that isn't what forgiveness is at all. And how we, when we operate like that, how when we see that person come to repentance, we've built up already so much hurt and so much hardness and so much bitterness in our heart that when they do come to repentance, we're not happy about it. We'd rather see God strike, a light, strike him with a lightning bolt or something like that. So tonight, we're going to take a look at the book of Jonah. If you'd turn there with me. You know, we, we know the, the story of Jonah. We know God wanted Jonah to go to Nineveh, to preach to Nineveh for repentance. We know Jonah didn't want to do it. We know he went as far as getting on a boat, the, the storm coming. And Jonah saying, finally admitting that I'm, I'm the reason the storm's here and if you just throw me over the side of the boat, everything will be okay. And so they do. They throw him over the side of the boat. And he gets, at first, he, the Bible says that he, he sinks almost to the bottom of the ocean before he's swallowed up by the, by the big fish. And, and, you know, one thing that I, I really, I didn't see before I, I began to study for this message, the one thing I didn't really see in this was that, Jonah, when he decided to be tossed over the side of the boat, what he was really saying was, I'd rather be dead than do what God wants me to do. I'd rather commit suicide than to see the, the city of Nineveh come to repentance. I don't want the task, God. I'd rather die. And then he gets swallowed up by the fish and... He's, 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 he's happy. He begins to, to, to tell God, thank you for saving me. And the fish spits him up on a shore close to Nineveh. And he tells God, I'll go do what you want me to do. And he goes to Nineveh. And he preaches repentance to them. And what happens? They repent. And we would think that, that Jonah would be happy about something like that. We think if we were Jonah, we'd be happy. But that isn't the case for Jonah. 
his attitude towards God was an attitude of, I knew this was going to happen. I knew this was going to happen. Listen to what chapter 4 says, beginning in verse 1. It says, But it greatly displeased Jonah, and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord and said, Please, Lord, was this not what I said while I was still in my own country? Therefore, in order to forestall this, I fled to Tarnish. For this I knew you are a God of grace and compassion, you are a God of graciousness and compassion, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness, the one who relents concerning calamity. Therefore, now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for death is better to me than life. And the Lord says to him, Do you have a good reason to be angry? Now, I don't know if, if, if in, in your fellowship with the Lord, how often he engages you with questions. But sometimes I think God in my life is the riddler. Because he, he often, when I'm dealing with something, will approach me kind of like he approached Jonah here. Here's Jonah dealing with, 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 with anger and unforgiveness. And God says, do you have a good reason to be angry? And so what does Jonah do? Does Jonah answer God? Well, in a way he does. But he disconnects the relationship. And he decides to turn and walk away. It says, Then Jonah went out from the city and set east of it. There he made a shelter for himself and sat under the shade until he could see what would happen to the city. So he's still expecting God's wrath to come down upon Nineveh. So the Lord God appointed a plant to grow up over Jonah, to be shade over his head, to deliver him from discomfort. And what a good God we serve. Even when we're angry at him, turn the other way and go and sit in our, and, and sulk in our pity and, 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 and anger. God still shows kindness and goodness to us. And Jonah was extremely happy about the plant. And you think he'd be beginning to get happy about Nineveh. But God appointed a worm, and then the dawn came, and the next day it attacked the plant, and it withered. And when the sun came up, God appointed a scorching east wind, and the sun beat down on Jonah's head so that he became faint and begged for all his soul to die, saying, Death is better than life for me. Then God said to Jonah, Do you have a good reason to be angry about the plant? And he said, I have good reason to be angry, even to death. Then the Lord said, You had compassion on, a, on the plant for which you did not work, and which you did not cause to grow, which came up overnight and perished overnight. Should I not have compassion on Nineveh? The great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who did not know the difference between their right hand and their left, as well as many animals. You see, I'd, I had heard the story of Jonah preached many different ways. I've heard the, the story of not doing what God wants you to do and God finding tactful ways to place you where he wants you. I've heard the stories of, uh, of Nineveh needing repentance. But, but what about Jonah's heart and what unforgiveness did to Jonah's heart? I want to take a little look at what forgiveness is. So if you would, turn your Bibles over to Ephesians chapter 4. I want to share a story with you. I believe I shared this when I was here on Christmas, um, but I want to share it with you again. I was in the St. Lucie County Jail um, for some crimes that I had committed. And at the time, 
I believed that uh, my brother-in-law had placed me there because he was the one who called the law and, uh, and they came after me. And so for a few months while I was in there, I began to really get a hard heart towards him. I talked about all the things that I was going to do to him the next time that I saw him. Now this is a, a, a funny sight because I was 120 pounds soaking wet and he was a bodybuilder. So he was massive and most people that I, I was in jail with knew who he was. We kind of ran in the same circles. So as I'm telling everybody what I was going to do to them, do to him, they were probably thinking inside, yeah, right. And so, <laughs> but it didn't stop me from, from telling him what I was going to do, that's for sure. And, uh, you know, God had a, a funny way of the whole time I was incarcerated with placing people in my life that were Christians, that, were, that you know, had fallen into some bad lifestyles, but we were now in jail and we're now really seeking the Lord to change their lives. And I had a bunkie, his name was Jimmy. Man, bless Jimmy's heart. You know what, Andy? He had patience. Because he, because he would listen to me rant and rave about my brother-in-law and for probably close to two to three months. And then one, one evening, I'm laying in my bunk, and, and somebody comes over and says, there's this guy in the next dorm, and he's, he's using sign language to tell us to get you. And so I go over, and I look through the glass, and you can kind of catty corner look through the glass and see him to the next dorm, and guess who it was? It was my brother-in-law. And so now I'm really angry. And, and he had the audacity to sign language me, saying he didn't have any canteen when I sent him, sent him some food. He really infuriated me. And so I go, so I go, 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 so I go, so I go, so I go, so I go back to, to, to my, my bunk, bunk. Watch, I hate this guy. And you know, Lord, the Lord had just begun to really work on my heart at this point. And um, you know, one night Jimmy just got tired of hearing me rant and rave, and he said, "George, I want you to do me, to do me a favor. He said, I want you to get up, go over and look through the glass, and tell me what your brother-in-law is doing right now." So I get up and I go over and I look through the glass and he's over there playing cards and he's laughing and he's having a good time and really enjoying jail the best way that you can, I suppose. And so that just blows my top. And I come back and I sit in my bunk and I'm like, he's over there playing cards and having a good time. How can he? Uh, at the time, I was, <laughs> I was facing more time and you know, more years in prison than I wanted to spend. I, I was looking at 10 years in prison. And I was just so infuriated because he was over there having a good time. And, and, and all I could think about was the life that I had thrown away. Jimmy, he just looked at me and said, Listen, Joel, you know that and all that hurt that's spewing out of you right now? He said, that's unforgiveness. And it's affecting you, not him. He doesn't feel any of that. Man, those, those, those words sunk me like, like I had cinder blocks tied to my feet. And Jimmy, I was going to say Jimmy Hoffa, but I guess he wasn't a gangster. He was one of the guys that came up missing, huh? <laughs> All right, like, huh? <laughs> All right, like, 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 like Tony so, 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 Soprano no, no, pushed me, me, me over the edge or something. And I, was, it just, it, I just began to sink at the weight of those words. I was laying in bed. I, I, don't, I don't think I slept that night. I was laying in bed, and, I, and I'm praying, and I'm like, anymore. I don't want to hold on to this anymore. And so I chose that night to forgive him. It was Tuesday night. Now, Wednesday, my, uh, my pastor at the time, um, faithfully, every week, every Wednesday, would come see me. And I'd get called out of the dorm and go down to the chapel, and we'd have some one-on-one -on -one visit. Unfortunately, this was also my small's pastor. So they're calling all the names for the chapel service, and my name gets called, a few other names get called, his name gets called. Now, I'll remind you, everybody in my dorm knew us, and if they didn't know us, they knew us now because I was in there telling them everybody what I was going to do, and they knew he was in the next dorm. And so the dorm's in kind of a U shape, and they're, they're coming around. They started on the other end, and they're coming around getting all the inmates, and I'm in the last dorm. He's in the second to last dorm. They're handcuffing them two by two. They get to my dorm, and guess who doesn't have anybody handcuffed to them? <laughs> you 
Needless to say, everybody in my dorm came out of their cells to watch what I was going to do. Because after all, I'd spent a few months in there telling them all what I was going to do. And so they, they let me out and they handcuffed me to them. And of course I didn't do anything. But everybody was down there just trying to see through the glass to, to see what I was going to do. And, and they, they carried us down the hallway and we didn't say anything to each other all the way to the chaplain's office. Chaplain's office. We get in there, we sit next to each, to each other. You, you, you know, he just leans, 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 leans over to me, to me, to me, to me, to me, to me, to me. He, 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 he says, for my life. And, and I just looked at him, I said, you know, Kevin, I said, I, said, I forgive you. It's not your fault oh, oh, why, 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 I'm, why I'm here. Um, you know, I took, I took ownership over it. And uh, from that point on, you know, our relation. Um, but I, I got taught a good lesson in that. And that was that our own unforgiveness can really begin to destroy us. And take a look at what, what Jonah's unforgiveness does to him over Nineveh. Jonah was a prophet of God. Told to go and preach repentance to a city of 120,000 people. And he does. And they repent. Now, any pastor would love to have that under his belt. That, that's that's, that's a, a, an awesome, that's Billy Graham kind of stuff. But it doesn't change Jonah's heart. His heart get stays hard to the point where he gets angry at God. I knew this was going to happen, God. After all, you're a God of mercy and compassion. I mean, can you imagine? So we take a look in the book of Ephesians, chapter 4. And we, we begin to understand why we forgive. <coughs> We're going to look, let's, let's start in uh, verse 25. It says, Therefore, laying aside falsehood, speak truth, each one of you, to, with his neighbor, for you are members of one another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. Do not give the devil an opportunity, for he, steals, for he, he who steals must steal no longer but rather must labor, performing with his own hands what is good, so that he will have something to share with the one who is in need. Let no unwholesome word proceed out of your mouth, but only such a word as is good for edification according to the need of the moment, so that it will give grace to those who hear. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption." Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Now Paul's telling the, the church of Ephesus this because Paul knows what these things can do to somebody's heart. We teach, down at the source we teach the Alpha series and the guy who, uh, who the Lord used to put this, this teaching together, um, he, he he'll tell you in the teaching that you know, if, if we're angry at somebody for longer than 30 seconds, it turns into hate in our heart. Now, that's his perception of it, but if that's true, that's not a lot of time to be angry at somebody. So here we have verse 32. It says, Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. One of the things the pastor said over this week um, in that sermon on forgiveness is that when God began to work on his heart, you know, first, before I share that with you, let me tell you, I, didn't ha I, I had a few different ways I was going to preach this chapter. And every time I got it together, the Lord said no. And so I was like, all right, well, I guess, I guess I'm just going to go in there and go with whatever I got. And then I heard this message that uh, Pastor Eric Reed preached on uh, on the fourth night and I realized what God was was wait, uh, allowing me to wait for and so, and so he, he, he talked, about, talked about how God began to work on his heart about that doctor allowed him to begin to reflect all the things that he was forgiven for by Christ and how could he hold this mistake over the head of this doctor 
And so we don't, we don't forgive because we don't, we don't want to release people from the wrongs that they've committed to us or to our family members. But when we read in 1 Corinthians like we did earlier today, we are to love one another and hold no record of wrongs. But holding no record of wrongs isn't forgetting what people have done to us. It's just not holding them responsible for it any longer. It's giving the responsibility to God to do what God wants to do with that person. That's what God wanted Jonah to do for Nineveh. He wanted Jonah to allow God to be responsible for the outcome. And when, and when, when Jonah finally did that, and God do, did what God does, brings people to repentance with compassion and mercy, Jonah got angry. We can't get angry today. We can't. We can't allow angry, anger to turn into to hatred and to hurt and to bitterness and to malice and to wrath because God didn't do that to us. So we see that, that love is needed for forgiveness and not a love that, that we can love within ourselves because we love, our, our, ourself, we love each other in a humanistic kind of love like if you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. If you love me, I'll love you. If you be nice to me, I'll be nice to you. But we see through 1 Corinthians chapter 13 that that's not the kind of love that God has placed in us through Christ. It's a love that keeps no record of wrongs. It's a love that does not fail. It's a love that is kind and gracious. So what is the truth about love? Turn to Romans chapter 13. We're going to start in um, about verse 8. It says, Owe nothing to anyone except to love, to love one another. For he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. For this, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. And if there is any other commandment, it is all summed up in this saying, you shall love your neighbor as you love yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. Do this, knowing the time that is already the, that is already the hour for you to awaken from the sleep, for now salvation is nearer to us than when we first believed. The night is almost gone and the day is near. Therefore lay aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us behave properly as in the day, not carousing in drunkenness and not, and not in sexual prom promiscuity and sensuality, not in strife and in jealousy. But put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh in regards to its lusts. And you see... Paul saying, "Listen, Jesus gave you know, Jesus was questioned. He said, what, what, are the, what is the greatest commandment?" And he says, "Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, and the second is just like it, not that there's two, they go hand in hand." He doesn't say, "Well, this is the greatest, and then this one is, is number two. He says, "The second is just like the first. Love your neighbor as yourself. You see, we love God. And we love others. And the Bible says that we can't love others unless we love God. And we can't love God unless we love others. And yet we cling to our unforgiveness. We cling to it as if it's our right to hold on to it. 1 John chapter 2 1 John chapter 2, 
Verses 7 through 11 say this. Beloved, I am not writing a new commandment to you, but an old commandment which you have had from the beginning. We're talking about the same commandments here. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. The old commandment is the word which you have heard. On the other hand, I am writing to you a new commandment, which is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. The one who says he is in the light and yet hates his brother is in darkness until now. And the one who loves his brother and abides in the light, there is no cause for stumbling in him. But the one who hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. If you ever meet someone dealing with unforgiveness and just will not let it go, you will see someone who is blind. Who is blind not only to the world around them, but to the love of Christ that is poured out upon them. And, you know, I wish I could say that we're talking about unbelievers here, but we're not. We're talking about us. I'm talking about me. See, the truth about forgiveness is this. He who wills not to forgive cannot be forgiven. And it's not that we make that choice not to forgive, and then God just strikes us out of the book of life. But if we're okay with our unforgiveness, if we're okay with holding on to that, then did we ever really know forgiveness from Christ at all? Because for me, you know, there, there, there are still people in my life that I need to forgive, and, I, and I'm, 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 I'm holding on to that, but God is at work in, in that. And he's saying, George, it's time to let this go. And he's telling you, it's time to let this go. But when we're so hard-hearted that we turn and run from God and unwilling to, 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 be, to, to forgive, then the question really remains, did we ever truly know Christ's forgiveness? Because if you know to the extent that Christ has forgiven you, and if I know to the extent that Christ has forgiven me, then sooner or later, hopefully sooner, that unforgiveness that I'm holding in my heart, I will no longer want to hold. Because it, God will make it so heavy and so, so painful that it, I'll, 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 I'll crush under the weight of it until I'm ready to give it to Him. You see... It boils down to this. Forgiven sinners become forgiving saints. That was Pastor Eric Reed's message that night. That was his final statement. And again, that was a statement that sunk deep into my heart. That forgiven sinners become forgiving saints. Now we might... We might deal with unforgiveness as Jonah did. We might, we might begin, you know, God might say, hey, you know, George, I really, really want you to forgive this person. And I might wrestle with God about that. But God will always win. God will always win. Because when it really boils down to it, all he has to do is point out to one thing that Christ died for me for. And then I realize, not only can I not hold this unforgiveness on this person, but if Christ died for me, for, for this one sin, just this one, whatever it is, he also died for, for this person, for whatever hurt or hang up that they caused on me. That's, that's seeing... Through, through the lens of the cross of Christ. And then we remain with God's question. What right do we have to be angry? How can we be angry when God 
is bringing people to repentance. I don't know about you, but I've had to ask a lot of people to forgive me. I caused a lot of hurt, a lot of harm in, in, in my previous lifestyle. And I've told a lot of people that I have forgiven them. And there are still people on my list that I need to forgive and that need to forgive me. But so far, everyone that I've encountered, it has went well. And I've had an opportunity to share Christ with them. Now I'm sure I'm going to run into that one that when I say either I forgive you or you forgive me, it's probably not going to go so well. But I, there's something about forgiveness that brings people to repentance no matter what side of the forgiveness you're on. I went on this week with these, with, with these, these teens really thinking, you know, here comes my pride, okay? Really thinking that I was going to add something to their lives and to their faith. And boy, did God humble me when they added to mine. When they were bold enough to share their hurts and I sat quietly. And when they were bold enough to come to me and share the pain that they held in their heart and God just began to open mine. So I want to encourage you tonight. You know, we... We still have breath. We still have life as of right now. Maybe there's somebody that God has placed on your heart during this message. Maybe there's a phone call you need to make. Maybe there's a neighbor you need to go see. I know when I leave here, I'm probably going to call my dad. But let me encourage you to do so. Because there's nothing like holding on to that unforgiveness and living with it. It's it's not existence at all. It's a life of pain. It's a life of suffering. And didn't Christ suffer enough for us already? Let's pray. Father, we, we thank you today for the forgiveness that you have offered to us. We thank you that it, it goes far more beyond us just receive it, but giving us the ability to give it. And Lord, may we forgive others as you have forgiven us. And may the weight of our unforgiveness be so heavy in our lives that it just brings us to our knees and that we just allow you to work on our hearts, in our minds, and in our lives. In Jesus' name.